Hello world, this is Shruti Pandey and today I have with me an amazing guest, Gaurav Sharma, the CEO and founder of SaaS Labs. Hello Gaurav, thank you so much for giving me your time and gracing my platform. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, do you want to say anything before we just start into the questions or should we just kick off with the three questions that I have for you? Uh, no, nothing special to say. I mean, I think we can just jump in. Awesome. Awesome. So my first question for you is, uh, ever since you graduated, you have been into, you know, founding or creating different startups. Uh, how did that happen uh, for you? Sure. So, I mean, uh, so my sort of entrepreneurial journey started uh, way back in high school uh, when I was in 11th class. So I got, uh, so my dad was in Air Force and then he got into education space where I got access to uh, computer and internet very early on. So, so I started writing code very early on. I was like, I think in seventh or eighth class when I started writing code. Uh, then I got so much influenced by this guy, Sabir Bhatia, who has just sold Hotmail uh, for an insane amount of money, $400 million amount of money back that, that time, uh, 20, 20 years back, I guess. Uh, I didn't know how much money that is, but I knew that it's a pretty big money, right? So, uh, so that got me hooked into this whole internet thing. Like, okay, I think people can make money from internet. So in my 11th class, I built my first business. And then in college, I, I, I got into an IT or angle, uh, chemical engineering. Uh, I always wanted to be a chemical engineer. I don't know why, but by third sem, I knew that I'm not going to be a great chemical engineer because my scores were not that great in my third sem. Uh, so I knew that I'm not going to be a good chemical engineer. So I continued my writing code part. Uh, and that's when I built my first legit uh, you know, company. Uh, it was into virtual stock exchange, kind of similar to what Zero Other is today. Uh, so, so that's that was like first legit business that started making money. I think the influence was always about, uh, you know, to to do really well, take my family out of this whole middle class thing. You know, had these huge big dreams. So, so that sort of influenced me. Second, I was like a pretty solid, uh, very interested product nerd sort of guy, always building stuff, always loving it when people using your software, right? So. Uh, I think these two things sort of mixed out and that's kind of pushed me to do my own stuff. And uh, while this journey is so amazing to listen to, uh, it is very surprising for me that uh, you were interested in coding and that too at a very young age. Like, do you still code? Uh, I do. On weekends, I do. Yes, uh, because I'm not. So I'll tell you. So when I started all my companies, I, I was the main sort of programmer, I think in SaaS class, because it's kind of big now, we have like 300 plus people now. Uh, I went coded for last two years or so, like actively in my products, but I always keep on building stuff on the, on the weekends. So you're still a passionate coder and you love to code, is it? I think it's all about, uh, more about I'm passionate builder. Uh, I have like, I don't know, like I have like 500 or 600 domain names. Uh, in my account, like I keep on buying a lot of domain names all the time um, <laughs> and always have these ideas, weekend projects that I keep on building. It just keeps you very fresh and sort of with the, with the time, you know, as the time is moving, you should also grow fast with the time. So I think I'm just keeping up uh, with the, the what, what's changing in the market, what's how people are doing the new programming and everything. Yeah. So just to keep yourself relevant, I would say. No, this is inspiring. And, you know, uh, these days you hear a lot about uh, people who, who love products and want to build products, but uh, very few of them are passionate or interested in coding. Like that is the one place which people are like, no, no, we don't want to get into that. In fact, yeah. I, I see of people who get into products so that they can get away from coding, you know, ironically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, this is exactly. so interesting to hear that uh, you're still passionate about coding and that's very inspirational and I think people should take uh, some lead uh, from you with respect to this because it only keeps you really uh, refreshing, new and up to date with what's happening yeah. in the market. Makes sense. So my second question for you is, is there a special hack for creating startups that you've gotten hold of? I'm not sure if that's mm -hmm. a yes or no for your answer, but what do you think uh, is a special hack of creating startups? Uh, yeah, I, I think there are going to be different hacks for different stages, right? So, uh, so one is like, what's a good hack to have a high probability that you won't fail, right? You will definitely fail in many of your startups, but what's the high probability? How can you increase your probability of not failing? 
I think the the hack there is you know like couple of things like for example, uh, if I'm so so side projects are different. If you're doing some proper company building or something, uh, I I really hate the word startup. You know, I I, I love to call it business rather. Okay. Uh, if you're building a legit sim, cra- good business, then uh, the first thing is the first hack is to always look for a a big market which is also growing. Mm. uh so why i say that is because uh, let's say one of our products just call it is in a contact center space we have like thousands of competitors mm. right but uh, so 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 if someone is new and starting something in a very uh, sort of uh, already sort of done market uh, they will always feel that hey i should actually know it i should build something new which no one has done i think that's a wrong way you should always do things which people have already done just do it better right uh so 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 when i say it, the market should be big and growing i mean that's very important it should be growing as well mm-hmm. uh why i'm saying that because let's say in case of just call this is about a 20 billion dollar market which is growing at about 10% every year uh so new 2 billion dollars are coming in the market every year so i don't have to compete with anyone i just to get some part of the new revenue this that is coming every year and i can still build a 100 million 200 million dollar revenue business right so it's very important to get into a growing market rather than a stagnant or a falling market for example uh, you ca- you you should not really build uh, something in let's say uh, fax as a as a as a business right like fax is a is a big market but it's a falling business right so uh, or for example uh, cable network business right it's it's a falling business again it's a huge market but it's falling market mm-hmm. uh, so always get into a growing market so i think that's kind of the hack uh, that i normally use when i'm investing or building Makes sense. So, does it also boil down to a very simple fact that is there really a problem to be solved, or is it just only about seeing that the market should be growing and there should be competitors and we shouldn't be the first one? Like, if I can understand this better. Yeah, probably. I think after doing this for so many years and after investing in so many companies, I think I have some sort of mental models with me that where I can figure out that okay, there's also a demand for a product. uh but i think the easiest test is that is it a vitamin or is it a, it's a painkiller right i think that's the simplest uh test uh if i come up with an idea that hey i can build a laundry laundry business or something it's yeah it's not a, it's it's not a painkiller it's like a vitamin right i mean i can also wash my clothes uh at my home right so you have to seriously figure out that vitamin versus uh, uh painkiller thing i think that's a very good litmus test uh to figure out the demand part uh and when you saw, talk about demand i think that the whole market is big and growing is kind of a proxy of demand right the market is growing with this demand uh so i think the answer gets solved in that uh, framework itself yeah no i mean sometimes i am seeing that uh, in the race of automating everything uh, rather than solving a problem sometimes people create problems so that they can solve it you know uh which yeah. i can find a good hack for creating any business any startup anything uh, for that matter so yeah, yeah, yeah. makes sense and i i asked you this question only because you know you have so many startups under your belt and uh, yep. it it felt like the most befitting thing to ask you like if i'm having you on the platform why yeah, not really good question yeah for sure yeah <laughs> also thanks so and my third and final question for you is any failure or success whichever lesson that taught you a great deal in your own entrepreneurial journey yep uh can talk about so many failures actually like uh, so so my first startup after uh college uh it was into a twitter advertising platform like twitter didn't have an ad network that time so i built a twitter advertising platform that time uh it scaled really well we had a lot of users and everything but i committed a typical first time entrepreneur specifically i think indian entrepreneur problem where i didn't charge much for my product right so i i had really good scale i had good number of customers a good number of advertisers but i was not charging enough my for my product right so it failed financially uh, and that was a big lesson for me and i have made sure that whatever products i build i will never play the pricing game ever uh so so even in our current case in saslas all the products that we have we are like premium products uh we are charging as per the value we are giving right so it, it, i think that's a very important lesson so as an inter- indian entrepreneur or even any entrepreneur for that matter and if you're a first time one whatever price your heart is saying just multiply that by 4 and charge that uh i think that's a simple simple formula that you have like if you feel that you charge 10 dollars for your product charge 40 dollars uh you know so so i mean that's that's a kind of formula that i kind of has worked for me uh and also a lot of startups that i have sort of invested in uh, so they are kind of also doing the same so i keep on pushing people to increase their prices 
only till the time then people start telling you that hey man it's just for expensive uh so keep on increasing your prices yeah so i think that's that's a very good lesson for me so uh, is this also because uh, you know as a matter of fact that humans being humans would probably negotiate with you so once you do that multiply by 4 do you think there will be a negotiation happening and the price will come down to maybe a sweet spot for them and you both or uh yeah i mean so 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 as so as you increase your prices obviously you also are keeping some margin for that negotiation right mm-hmm. um and i think it's again it's again uh i should not say that very unpopular opinion i would say it's a very india thing uh you know because uh, i've not so so when i moved to us i mean the first thing i didn't notice was that people are actually uh valuing the the value a product is giving uh you know and after that they are asking the price uh so in my mind when i'm buying a software in my mind i know what sol- what problem this thing going to solve and i know the dollar value of that problem uh for example in case of just call just call helps your sales people to automate your all your manual work so that's like uh you know that's like about 10 hours every month we are saving every sales person cost like 20 dollars to 50 dollars per hour so that's like 200 dollars to 500 dollars problem per month right. so if my product is charging anything less than that they will pay for it right uh so for example we charge like 30 dollars to 60 dollars that's like a 10x roi so they will never ask for a discount there because they know i am anyways getting a 10x return there uh so so most of the at least in the b2b most of people think in roi terms and it's totally fine if your product the ticket price is on the higher side but if the value is on the like 10x then they're going to pay for it this, this so i think you should respect yourself you should respect your product you should respect yourself and ask the right price uh yeah. if someone says that it's insanely expensive it doesn't make any sense it doesn't value you the value you're giving i think they're not the right customer in that case mm. this absolutely yeah. makes sense and uh while you didn't want to touch on to you know the indian thing i'm glad you spoke about it because it is true and in in my own experience yeah. uh be it as an employee or be it as uh, an advisor that i'm getting started in the mode of it only makes yeah. sense because in india either people come to you for free advice and there is so much free advice right already or even if you're doing something for them and we often are uh, trained in the very middle class mentality where we think okay yes. you're a very giver kind of a person we like theek hai help kar deta hai like okay we will help this yeah, person yeah. and stuff like that so i i think uh, thank you so much it, it, i don't know if this lesson is going to be followed by everyone but this is giving me yeah. a lot clarity that yes respect yourself awesome. respect your time and respect the value you bring to the table absolutely makes sense this has been such an intelligent conversation and uh, an eye opening one like seriously for for mm-hmm. me and i'm pretty sure uh, the audience is also going to get a lot of uh, insights and that to very crisp and brief uh, uh, keeping it very crisp and brief thank you so much for hitting exactly and the point I'm not beating around the bush so yep. thank you so much uh, for that gorav and in case you have any parting thoughts that you may want to add before we wrap this up the floor is all yours uh no i think i'll just say uh, one one thing um so so whenever you starting any business i think make sure you try to bootstrap as long as you can mm. uh don't whenever you starting something don't don't give a reason that i i need money to start this thing i mean obviously if you're starting a cement plant then you will need money but if you're starting a tech business then if you're building something then i think you should not look for money i mean in our, in our case that worked out really well i mean all my businesses were like bootstrap even even sas labs i bootstrap for four years uh to about almost 7 8 million dollars error and then we raised money Uh, uh right so so i think yeah that this is something i really want to uh, everyone should you know care about they should think about that they should bootstrap as long as they can because that's going to help them generate more value for themselves and the employees in longer term and they'll have more hold over the company in the longer term so i think that's that's very important uh, no one talks about it uh, and i think the second thing i would say again is if you're bootstrapping make sure your first goal should be to build your business to a level where you can start paying yourself salary and i've seen a lot of entrepreneurs they don't pay self any salary to themselves and then they start feeling burnt out uh so i think that's a very good hack if you're building something bootstrapped the your first milestone is to take your business to an, an amount where you can start paying yourself salary and that feeling of getting salary from your business 
it will liberate you so well that your business will scale so fast. Uh, very random advice here, but uh, you know, no one talks about it. So I was just, you know, I should tell. No, it's not random advice. You have, you know, literally launched truth bombs today is how I look at it. Because <laughs> every every answer, every sentence you spoke of was uh, uh, honestly the right things to do, which uh, you as you rightly said, people don't talk about it. And probably we should be talking about it. Or maybe it's yep. just like one of the secrets people want to keep it behind and not let the world know. But there's no point in doing that. So uh, thank you so much for all these wisdom nuggets. Thanks, Shruti. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. I mean, great to uh, chat with you. Great questions. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.